Carlos the Kami Conclave Crasher, Interview 1. In this video, I will interview Carlos, a survivor of communism in Nicaragua and an American military man, a man who understands the importance of protecting the nation from enemies both foreign and domestic. A man who spied on BAMN from the inside, attending their meetings, hanging out with Yvette Falarca, the wannabe communist dictator, and her comrades. He then crashed their press conferences and their court appearances and was attacked by this guy, the guy who called for murder of innocent people. For more on that, see my video titled Antifa slash BAMN calls for murder. That video is not necessary to see to understand this video, but I do highly recommend seeing the video titled Carlos, the man who infiltrated Antifa and BAMN in order to fully appreciate what Carlos said in this interview. There are links to these videos in the description below as well as links to other stuff mentioned in this video. I'm sorry that it took me so long to put this video out. I had multiple sound issues that I did my best to fix. Even my backup camera kept going out on me during this interview. Also, there was a low battery alarm on a smoke detector that was chirping in the earlier portion of this video. I did my best to take out those loud chirps with a sound mixing program, so that's why there will be little milliseconds of silence earlier on in this video, but I was able to totally fix the sound after that. Quick note, we didn't actually formally start this interview, we just started talking before I even hit record, so that's why this interview starts as it does. Please share this video on social media everywhere, and especially share it with any communist or Antifa sympathizers that you encounter on social media, and enjoy their hysterical reactions. So, here we go! And that's why we're fighting, because, you know what, I'll be gone, but what about my kids' kids? Is this? I want them to enjoy the privileges that that I have, to, you know, that I've been able to enjoy the freedoms. You know, I came from a communist country, and I and that's how we got here. And I will tell you, I had my freedoms taken away, and I saw how evil these people are, and I lived it. And you know what? You, if you don't fight for America, this is who's gonna. These people is what who's gonna be in charge, and and they already have plans of. You know, you're, you know, you only have two choices. You're either going to get uh, re-educated or you're going to be uh, uh, be uh, either executed or put through. If you're, if I guess if you're healthy enough, they put you on a forced labor camp, the, uh, the, the gulag, they actually call it. So, and it's like, is that what you really want? You know, if you don't fight for, if you don't fight for this, there's no place to go. America is the last bastion of freedom that's standing that has to completely pulled it. Lots of these people say they do not believe in private property, that private property should be taken away from people. So like say people who have had farms for generations, just like they did in Russia, take away their farm and they give it to people who have no idea what to do with the land. So everybody starves. Yep. Amazing. Well, let me ask you about, um, I guess we're going to do this a little bit more informally. You did say at one point in the video, and then you just said just now that you've experienced communism. So what country did you come from? Nicaragua. Ah. Back, uh, back when the uh, 1979, when the uh, communists uh, had the revolution, and see Nicaragua was easier because heck, Nicaragua can literally fit what the greater the greater uh, heck Nicaragua can fit in the, in the Bay Area. I mean, if you if you grab the whole Bay Area, or that or what, call, what I call them uh, the uh, if you were to include what we you know the uh, I would say. Like one third of Southern California, that's it will actually fit there, no problem. But you know, only about forty percent of Nicaragua is actually populated. The other thing is is mostly uh, rainforest. So you know, so that's that's what I'm saying. So if you actually got the popular areas, you know, you can fit it there. So there wasn't really much. It didn't take them that long to uh, throw the government, but that's exactly how this you know they they started. It took them a few years, and they. Uh, Took over the uh, the, you know, the schools, the universities, the uh, teachers, brainwashing the young kids, and you know, and the, the young kids they, they don't know any better. They uh, easily manipulate it, and you know, they they jump jumped into their propaganda. And my brother and two stepsisters uh, actually fought for the Revolutionary Army, and when when they triumphed, guess what happened? They were the first ones to be run up to get executed. They both, all three of them, had to flee the country, but many didn't have the chance. Many, you know, many of them, they uh, and they were like, didn't understand because like here you are, we believe in the revolution, and we help you get up here, 
killed a lot of people, many people lost families, and now that you're in power, now they're coming after us. Why? Well, because they don't understand. The Falarkas of the, of the world, the Ashanta drivers of the world, they're nothing but puppets. And if they, and these people get, they throw their lives into it because they think they're going to have a, a, a place at the table. They won't have a place at the table. But no, all, those people throughout history, they always get killed by those who just step up above them. Well, they, and they have to. And actually, when you look at the, uh, uh, at the writings of uh, Karl, you know, Karl Marx and Lenin, uh, and even, uh, what's his name, and uh, this guy, uh, uh, Saul Alinsky, Rules for Radicals. <laughs> Rules for Radicals. And, uh, yeah, and, well, you know what? He modified his writings to fit our society. Uh, America's plan to overthrow the government was only supposed to happen within 30 years. They've been at it in 1960s, like fully at it. Like fully added in 1960, they've been in Americans uh, like since the uh, 19, 1920s, I think. Uh, that's when they've been trying to uh, to sl slowly organize, but actually have have a plan to overthrow. It starting back in the 1960s, late 1950s, and you know, and that's when the weather underground, the, the weatherman came over, and then they went to the weather underground. Then they, and most of them disappear, uh, you know, after they did the bombings. And what happened? Most of them are you know, university professors, and they never get got held accountable, which is kind of BS. You know, these people need to pay for what they've done, and and that's and, and that's what it is. If you read their uh, uh, their writings, that's one of uh, things I have to do. They are useful idiots, and but because they are so radicalized, they have to be get get erased. Kind of okay, you know, thank you, we use you, but now you got to go because the moment when they realize they no longer have a a say or any power or a place at the table, well, these guys were the ones that organized the revolution. And in order to keep, for you know, the next revolution to happen to overthrow them, well, they have to get rid of them because they now are the biggest threat. So they have to get rid of them. Take away all the weapons, build a very strong military, uh, you know, and, and basically a militarized police force, police state. And what, what uh, you know, what, what choice you have, and then you make, you make the uh, the environment so difficult, so difficult to organize that people will even become paranoid against your neighbors and, and and family members. That it makes it hard to organize against them because you don't know who is in, who is out, who's going to turn you, you know, turn you over to the government. And I saw that in Nicaragua. I'm oh my god. And the thing is, like I was saying, I saw this happen. How they infiltrated the schools, how they went after their kids, how you see. I was mentioning this not too long ago. The only reason I know, you know, it seems like in America there is an attack on whites. There's only one reason: is because whites are the, you know, by far the largest ethnic group in America, and you know they, you know, uh, so they see them. Okay, you know, in order to split those conservative voices and those who would not, they have to go against them to fragment them to divide them. And bring them down. They, that, they don't care about whether they're white or not. They really don't. But that's just part of the plan. In Mexico, the same Antifa and BAM people are over there in Mexico. They're in Venezuela. They're in you know in Nicaragua right now. We don't hear about whites or anything. Why? Because that is not the problem. The problem is, yeah, it's exactly. So the issue over there is the the haves versus the have-nots. So once they fragment the the the, the, the uh, ethnic groups. Then they're gonna continue, and uh, you see that they're doing a multi, multi-sided uh, attack. You know, they're going with the haves and the haves, the one percent. You know, the poor, everybody's poor, but they, you know, but they have enough money for bling bling and and their iPhones and all the crap. But yeah, you know, they, they you know, they're, they're poor. When there's actually people that are there, you know, we do have people in rural rural uh, America that industries have left the towns and. People are, you know, literally, you know, starving. If you was, if it wouldn't, wouldn't be for soup kitchens and churches, these people would be starving by now. But yet, the people in the big cities, they talk about how poor they are, but they have enough money for weed and enough money for beer, enough money for iPhones, and the bling bling. bling. It's like, come on, I grew up in East LA. It's like, it's like you, you can't tell me what poor poverty is. I've seen poverty up hand, and not in East LA. I've seen it in 
Nicaragua, I've seen it in Iraq, I've seen it in, in different parts of the world, you know, uh, uh, of the world. That is poverty. What we have here, yeah, we have low income, but not poverty, you know. And those people that are actually in poverty, they're not here in, they're not in the big cities. At this point in the video, I asked Carlos a question about communism. I forget the specifics, sorry, but here's his answer. Part of the training, you know, once it took over, literally, which would bring me to another point, is uh, you hear the, you know, the uh, propaganda day in, day out in the schools. As a matter of fact, they came out with the new uh, national anthem, and you had to sing that the communist anthem before the national, before the country's anthem. They, they have their own, you know, anthem, and it talks about the uh, proletarian and the evil imperialists and all these things. So, it's like the radio stations, it was the same thing. Yeah, they play some music here and there, but mostly was revolutionary music. Uh, they shut down all the channels, and there were only two channels, and one would start broadcasting at, five, at 3 o'clock, the other one at 5, but both of them would go off, off the air by 9.30. And it would be nothing but, man, I, you, you know, you'll sit there, and at any given point, it will be one of the commanders, or, or like, or like, uh, Ortega or Fidel Castro. They they love Fidel Castro, and they'll sit there. And Fidel Castro can literally sit there and, and give a three four hour speech, five hour speech, just ranting. And they'll they'll put it. And there wasn't really much to hear. And even a lot of the uh, movies that there were a lot. There were a lot of revolutionary movies, a lot of Russian movies that with translations. And you couldn't get away from it. Uh, and the way they organize. Uh, the communities is basically the fr they, they divide the communities they, like they say the capital city they'll divide it into into zones the zones will go go, go into uh, into uh, sub zones then into neighborhoods then the neighborhoods uh, will divide into streets and in each in each uh, neighborhood there will be what they call a communal house and the, uh, each neighborhood will have what they call the uh, the uh, person in charge of that neighborhood. So he will keep a roster of every member of in that uh, in that neighborhood. And when, and once a week, whenever they had the uh, their uh, their meetings, you, you know, each household had to send one representative, and they would keep a roster. And if you didn't show up, guess what? When uh, because they were uh, rationing the 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 food. And every month you will get your rationing card. And guess what? If you didn't show up, your card will mysteriously be misplaced. So people have to go and show up. And that's how you'll see, like in Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, like all these places, you know, they have all these big demonstrations, pro government demonstrations, and you see these hundreds of thousands of people out in the street, you know, uh, uh, supporting the government. And people say, look. And you know the communists here said, "Look, the the people love them. What they're not showing you is that, bef you know, before the event, they say, tomorrow, you know, next week it's an event. There's serious meeting, and then it, you know, each household would provide, depending on the side, a minimum of, you know, two people that will go from each household, and they will get bus in there, and you know, and they, you know, and and they will keep a track who's go who's going, who didn't show up, and so." When you when you go to the uh, plaza, it would be filled with people, and they all be going, "Oh, I love you!" Because they would be uh, videotaped, and if the better thing you'd see you, they would smile. Because if not, your rationing card will disappear, or you end up in jail, or depending on how bad your your if you sit there and you say say something anti-revolutionary, because that was the term, anti-revolutionary. Uh, a, you know, a, a, a military uh, style uh, patrol car would pull up to your house at two in the morning. They take you out, and you're, you know, you're lucky if you only got a, a good beating and probably detained for a month, because a lot of times they'll hold you away and they'll never see you again. And that was constantly. Yeah, and one the other thing, and the other thing that you were saying about the kids. Uh, they started to uh, get into a program that they call it like the, uh, the kind of like the Hitler's Youth, but they call it the, uh, you know, the, the uh, Los Jóvenes Revolucionarios, which is the, the revolutionary youth, which was their version of the Boy Scouts. And you have, basically, it's, it's, it's Antifa meetings. And you have to go all over them. And 
after 12, the government, no, you no longer own your kids. By age 14, they had to serve in the military, in, 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 the, in the army. And the one thing that they will, you know, they'll brainwash the kids to, if you even heard your, your parents saying anything anti-revolutionary, saying like, this government sucks, they're starving us, that was grounds enough for them to turn you in. And when a kid will turn in their parents, in order to keep the, the other immature kids brainwashed, they will parade, parade this kid around town as a hero. They'll even give him a military rank of like lieutenant, and he'll you know he'll be taking onto like all these in, you know interviews and all things. So in the mind of a kid now they you know now now they become national heroes for turning in their parents for complaining that they're starving or that there's or that there's or there's something wrong with the government. They didn't even have to plan anything. That's just all you had to do is complain, and there were grounds to turn you in. So. And we and that's 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 the way we're heading. If we, we if we do not stand up and 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 stamp this out, which these guys have had for a long time, they've been at it for a long time. We're actually behind the power, you know, the, the power ball on this one. We, uh, and it's going to take a lot, but we need to be proactive. We need to take this seriously because they do, and they will not stop. And if we even get comfortable. Uh, you're, you know, we're done. Like I tell people, where where would you go? Because I mean, where you know, unless you're gonna go find like a one one of the news, one of the uh, small islands of the Pacific, and you know, and go hide yourself. Where, where what what are you gonna do? And the other thing is, uh, you hear this garbage day in and day out. And I tell you, I was never pro, uh, you know, pro the government. Uh, we oppose them, obviously, uh, privately, because you couldn't do it publicly. And I really uh, despise the, the communists. But when I came to the United States as a 14-year-old kid, I did not realize how much, uh, you know, since they repeat these lies day in, day out, and you hear this propaganda that even though you don't agree with them, a lot of them sticks. And when I came to the United States, I was an Antifa kid. I hated America. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's like I came here with a idea that, it, you know, this was a racist country and a bigger country and it was an imperialistic regime. And I found myself repeating the same garbage. And one day I literally had to, to like, it took me, it's like, it just hit me. And I was like, what the heck? I'm I'm repeating the same garbage for the same people that kill family. So a lot of my family members, and 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 you don't realize. And it's the same thing. They put all this garbage day in, day out, and they brainwash our kids. So by the time they make it to a college uh, or college or a high school, and one of these teachers that because remember, teachers are supposed to be people we can trust, and they get a hold of them. They just easily brainwash, you know. They they they're ready right for the pickings because they're being exposed to all these lies and how wonderful communism is. That there's they don't even fight, you know. They just like, oh yeah, you know that, you know, power to the people, and they think they're cool, and they they think they're joining a good movement, and they don't realize how brainwashed they've been for a long time. So. Yeah, and these people are, uh, have have been come so involved in that they don't care anymore. They they come out and straight out and say it. You know, they want to do away with the United States. Heck, you know, they even print they print. Uh, I know there were some manuals some manuals uh, online about the Antifa manual, and uh, people were acting like uh, this was like top secret. No, it's not top secret. You just go to a revolutionary bookstore <laughs> that, that you can buy it there, which is funny because they're anti. You know, anti-profit and all that stuff, but yet you know they sell books. And this is and this is the new the, the newest revision because they call it the new communism. It's supposed to be the you know the new plan. And as as you started reading, this is the science, the strategy, the leadership for an actual revolution and a radically new society on the road to real emancipation. The fu funny thing is, you start I started reading through this same garbage. Different name, 
but they want to make it, you know, because they're trying to sell to the kids. Well, this is the new system. It's kind of like Bernie Sanders saying, you know, this is not socialism. It's democratic socialism. Uh, socialism is always democratic because it's, it's supposed to be the majority rule and they are the majority uh, side with the government at gunpoint. <laughs> and there's there's uh, another book. I don't know if you had a chance to read it. It's called the uh, uh, the Naked Communist, which describes the plan that they had in place. That uh, because it was written by a man that used to be a the head of the KGB, uh, and you know, and he came and you know wrote the book to give us a warning, and he disclosed the plan. That the USSR, because the, the, the KGB is a think tank organization, not like the CIA, and their job is to look at a country that they want to, you know, overthrow. Look at their history, look at their constitution, look at the dynamics of society, and then they will generate a plan based on that to overthrow the country. And they have put one uh, uh, for America, and it was supposed to take like 30 years to do. And if you look at uh, look at it on it, uh, you can actually see this. Find this online. It's called the uh, 45, the 45 go uh, communist goals for America, and you can actually get it. Uh, it which is it's an excerpt of the book, and uh, you can find it for free uh, uh, on a PDF P PDF format. And when you read it, I don't know if you ever had a chance to read, but when you read it. You literally sit there and you sh it, it, it'll give you the chills because the book was written in 1958 about things that were happening in 1953. And you look at everything and you realize that the vast majority of the goals, they have already been accomplished. But one of the, the United States, uh, a lot of them has been uh, accomplished. There's a few that it's bigger steps that haven't been able to. And the reason the United States hasn't fallen yet is because America has a unique constitution, unlike any country in the world, and they haven't been able that, uh, they haven't been able to overturn it. And they right now they're programming the next gener the next two generations into uh, accepting to rewrite the constitution. And you see a lot of the politicians uh, are saying things like the constitution is a racist document. The Constitution is misogynistic. The Constitution is a uh, document that is out of, state, uh, out of step with, with today's world and it needs to be brought up to today's standards. Uh, uh, what his name, uh, Barack Obama actually said that, that, you know, that the Constitution is a, an outdated document that needed to be brought up to standards. That there were a lot of things that he wanted to do, but the Constitution didn't let him. So, so that is one of the reasons America hasn't been overturned, and that we have to protect it. But they're already on the on that phase to uh, re-educate the students and the kids to look at the Constitution as a document needs to go away. And they already have. It used to be only online, but now you can actually buy the copy. At, like places like Revolution Revolution uh, Store, uh, their Constitution, uh, what they already written up, which is the. Uh, the uh, uh, People's, People's Republic of North American uh, 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 Constitution, uh, the People's Republic, the Socialist People, or something like that, but it's People's Republic of North America. And, you know, I read through them, and, all my, you know, it's just like, yeah, it's, they want another Venezuela, they want another North Korea. That was pa part of the plan when they uh, made the 30 uh, year plan to overthrow America, uh, it's one of the steps. Unfortunately, one, you know, another step that is happening is to uh, get students and people to accept that uh, violence in the name in the name of pol political advancement of things is accept is acceptable. Basically, that uh, the only way to get a real attention from the people and the government is to actually uh, uh, do violence, and that is normal. And if you notice. Uh, that is actually been put, been one of the things that have been pushing since, since the 60s. And then it went away for a while, and now it's come back again. Uh, after Obama getting, getting office, it's become more and more normal and acceptable for the left 
because even the media, which is another point, was to infiltrate all uh, you know all the media. So the media is no longer an outlet to inform the the masses. It is a they are a political propaganda machine. That's all they are now. Another other goal was to uh, infiltrate, take over one, or it actually says to take over one or both parties. Uh, the Democratic Party is not the classic liberal party anymore, and as you can see, the uh, the establishment they say that they you know they are, are against this, against that, but they all are working together, you know, and supporting each other into advancing this Marxist idea. And a lot of them, the so-called uh, you know, they are all rhinos that are sitting there, uh, supposed to be Republicans, but yet they're siding. With the other side, but that's because they're infiltrated. They're already, they, they're really not, yeah, it's the money. They're already being bought up. At this point, Carlos and I took a quick break and then came back on. After we came back on, we had no more sound problems. A few moments later. Naked communist. Can I get by, uh, Leo's, uh, Skousen? Uh, oh, anyways, the, uh, one of the richer one that thinks this says over here about the schools, because okay. this is pertinent to, uh, What's been going on in America, because America is a country that spends the most in education, and yet we, are ha we keep falling behind and keep falling behind. And every year, the students, I mean, the, uh, the faculty goes out and they want more money, and they always say, it's about the kids. It's about the kids. Right. And then they come out with, uh, new, they come out with new programs and things like uh, Common Core and Common Core Math. Yes. And it's just dumbing them down even more. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is, uh, point number 17, get control of the schools. Use them as a transmission belt for socialism and Korean communist, communist propaganda. Mm -hmm. Soften the curriculums and mm -hmm. get control of the teachers' associations and put part in line in the textbooks. Get con no, 18, get control of all student newspapers. 19, use student riots to foment public protests against programs or organizations which are under, are under attack by the, uh, by, uh, under communist attack. So basically, use the students to riot and put pressure, uh, you know, on any organizations that whatever the communists are deciding to attack that day, right. to go after them. So right. it's actually, you know, so this is, and if you if you look at the book itself, the book uh, copy, because this is obviously a reprint, the yeah, copy, uh, 1958, I mean, might be a little, see if I can get it in there. Let's see. Where it says uh, copyright. Uh, move it over to one, oh, can't really see it, it's out of focus. <laughs> move it a little bit further back. And there we go. Yes. Okay. 1958, 64, 66. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was when originally this book was posted down as a warning to America. And they had gone out of their way. And he's, you know, obviously he's not the only one. There have been many pictures that have come out publicly. But they're controlling the media and they've been at it for a long time to, uh, to manipulate the way we think, the way we do. You know, all they have to do is uh, keep saying Russia, 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 even though it's been proven that they are the ones. Yet I go to Berkeley or I go to San Francisco and I'll still have somebody tell me, the Russians, Russians, Russians. <laughs> yeah. Now, thankfully, Ridiculous. they don't have complete and total control over colleges. Uh, the information that is being put out in terms of propaganda, you see, because... Uh, I, I'm, I'm taking a, a little hiatus for my YouTube channel also because I can't afford it right now. i got to work uh, from college. But I've, I've been in college up until just a few months ago um, yes. trying to get a psychology degree. Now, I noticed that when I was schooling in Texas, there was a very marked difference in the way that things were taught and what was taught then in Oregon, where I am now. So in Texas, it was uh, mostly apolitical stuff. There was a little bit of, uh, you know, this whole thing about how, you know, there's infinite numbers of genders and gender no longer means uh, what sex an animal is. It now means the social construction. There was a little bit of that in one class that I took in Texas. In 
Oregon in just a an advanced psychology elective, the amount of what you could call political correct or cultural Marxist sort of in stuff in that one course was amazing. I mean, we were being taught in a science class that the scientific method, uh, the, in other words, of, of doing research and having people test it and test it again and try to disprove you and only after your hypothesis has been tested, does it become a theory and all that kind of stuff. They wanted to undermine that because they called it a weird construct. And weird stands for Western Educated Industrialized Rich Democracies. Uh, in other words, code word for white, heterosis, male, blah, blah, blah. It's bad because it's a tool of oppression. And there was even a test that I took, I took a snapshot of it, where the question was asked about uh, the RDOC, which is a very uh, useful handbook used by medical doctors, about one criticism of it, and I wrote down, oh, well, it's a tool for white male oppression and uh, weird industrialized uh, rich democracies, oppression and colonization of people, and blah, blah, blah. And my teacher loved that answer. It was an incorrect answer, but she loved it. She loved it. That's, that's what they want to hear. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my point here is that there is a very, uh, there are, it's not all uniform, it's not homogenous in what they're teaching the colleges, but it may very well be if it goes further and further. I mean, Texas is going to be one of those holdouts, but they probably teach the same stuff that I just described to you, probably, in New York, California, Washington State, many other places, Canada, and, and, You know, and, uh, when you go to, uh, I mean, because uh, I had to take three years of medical school, and one of the things about it is that, uh, they're just, you know, because of social uh, social pressure, one, big money from these think time leftist organization that are uh, lobbying, uh, you know, for this. And also because the politicians already sided with them, you know, they're already infiltrated, so they're passing this down. Because they know what side uh, their bread is better don buttered on. Oh, uh, yeah. And, they, and so what they're doing is, 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 is very simple. It's just they, I mean, they're creating a problem. You know, the problem is racist, American, oppressive, uh, white, you know, supremacy. And the solution is, oh, we're getting overthrown. But remember, it's not enough to have uh, teachers. They have to be able to put out uh, psychologists that would be willing or they frankly been taught uh, to when, when these people come seeking mental health that it's okay. It's the white supremacy. Right. It's okay for you to be called, you know, not he, because now you are a a a a, a them or, or or whatever, you know, or the. So you have to be able to find a way to reinforce it. So they also take into uh, and actually I think that's one of the steps to take over the psychological as uh, 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 use the uh, the power of the state to enforce. Uh, uh, mental health issues and psychological things. Mm. Which is so we're talking like, about changing I mean, the social norms to serve yeah, their agenda. So, th th so th th that has been a part of it. And, and they have, they were almost giving up until they elected one of their own, which Barack Obama, uh, he, you know, he is an Alinsky disciple, so is Hillary Clinton. And as you can see, they like to the thief, they like to the thief, and they will never admit it. They can get caught. You can have fingerprints and pictures and audio, and they'll still say, hey, "Why me?" Yeah, and they'll sure. create another scandal to say, "Look, right. look over there, a, a racist white man over there," you know? Yeah, yeah. Or another cop just shot somebody, and then he goes away. Yeah, indeed. Wow. Well, um, quick question: Have you ever read George Orwell's Animal Farm and or 1984? Yes. Okay. So I noticed when you're describing Nicaragua that. A lot of the the main uh, staples were there. So you mentioned how it was hard to be anywhere without government propaganda being visible to you somehow. Yes. Um, and also, okay, in 1984, there was the telescreen where government has total control. There was one channel and it goes off and on whenever they have something to say and they only have propaganda to say, you know. Um, there's that. Then there was, let's see here. Oh, about how in both uh, 1984 and what you described to me, they get a hold of the kids, and you know we know this. And somehow George Orwell knew about these things before the rest of the West knew, because when he was writing this book, 
there was a very much a, a, a control of information. People didn't realize how bad things were in USSR until the later 40s or perhaps the 50s or something like that. People had no idea how bad it was, but Orwell did because he's, you know, he fought uh, in the Spanish Civil War and he saw what the socialists were doing and he just yeah. studied these things. So then there was the way that you take kids, well, you drive a wedge between the children and the family so that they're more loyal to the state. And as you mentioned, they're even more loyal to communism than nationalism. Then underneath that comes the community and the family and all that. So that you have children that are being used against their parents and other members of the community so that they could tell on them. And, you know, we saw this not only in socialism, but also in, uh, the, you know, during the Third Reich. You know, of course, they had that going on. There was also... Um, Oh, mandatory attendance of what in 1984 they called it they called it um spontaneous demonstrations but you understood they were anything but spontaneous they were mandatory and as you described in Nicaragua there it was mandatory to attend these things and to pretend like you know yay because you know otherwise you might commit what they called in that book face crime if you showed that you were not actually enthusiastic if you had a scowl on your face well you might disappear in the middle of the night as you described people disappearing in the middle of the night which does happen in communism. And it's not just in Nicaragua, it's not just in fiction. Venezuela, Cuba, yeah. you know, it happened in China. Uh, by far, uh, socialism as, a, a, as a idea, as an ideology, has killed the most out of everybody, even more than Hitler. They are, but the, the, the difference is, is that Hitler was an individual that got one country to commit these atrocities all within a certain amount of time yes. versus communism. You know, you know, Pol Pot, you know, Chairman Mao, yeah. uh, and all, you know, you know, Stalin, Lenin, and all these people—they done it throughout, uh, you know, certain amounts of time, and because they control the facts, it's being pushed away, or nobody wants to talk about it, and but, but people don't realize, uh, in the you know, and they are, uh, it's part of their books where it says, you know what, you have to do it. You know, if you want your your wonderful utopia to come about, certain things must be done, and right. you have to be willing. Uh, che Guevara, uh, you know, he, he kind of rephrased it, and he said that uh, that uh, a revolutionary must be willing, um, you know, a uh, true revolution must be willing to kill on, you know, like on command, uh, you know, in the in the name to further the revolution. Yeah. Uh, and they have no problem with it, and that's unfortunately they train, you know, these kids. You see these uh, Antifa kids that they're willing, you know, you know, willing to stab, willing to do, you know, anything, yeah. because they truly believe that you know they're being brainwashed. They really believe that you know what, they they are heroes. They they're opposing and they're bringing about true change. They honestly, when they see Star Wars, they see themselves as the rebels, not realizing that no, dude, you're actually the Empire. Right. You're actually yes. working for the empire, and sure. once the, and once you triumph, then you will have the empire. But you know, but they don't they don't see that. They actually see themselves as heroes. And the thing they is, most that. people dehumanize. Yes, and most people don't realize that uh, the statement "punch a Nazi" is already presupposing that the person that you are accusing of being a Nazi is an actual Certainly. Nazi. So, for yes. example, the man that we were talking about earlier in your video that was in the courthouse, the man with the afro that was talking to the politician man, he was at one point asked, well, have you ever listened to the people? He called them Nazis, I believe. It's hard to hear, but I believe he doesn't say the people that you call Nazis. I think he says, have you ever listened to those people? Something like that. The man replies, why would I ever listen to a Nazi? I don't need to. I don't to well, my, my answer would be so that you know they actually are a Nazi in the first place. Because, like you said in the video while you were recording it, if that's the precedent you're going to set, well, then somebody could just call him a Nazi, and then it's legitimate to punch him. If that's, yes. if that's where we're going to go. I mean, basically, we... It, and people on the left are actually getting mad when I say this on social media. If you say people are innocent until and unless they are proven guilty in a fair trial by a jury of their peers, they are innocent. It's an American concept, by the way. Right. Because everywhere else, you're guilty. And and the sad part is, you're in jail, and it's up to you to prove your innocence. Yes. How the heck do you do that when you're, when you're locked up? <laughs> right, and especially if they do things like give you a catch-22. 
in a Kafka, Kafka, or I'm sorry, a Kafka trap. Well, basically, a Kafka trap is a catch twenty two, where they say you are they define uh, somebody as guilty if they are accused in the first place. So, for example, to go back to the psychology course that I took last summer, University of Oregon, and I've shown this in my video about this, folks. So there'll be a link below. They literally did teach that the definition of a microaggression is the felt experience of the person who is saying that somebody committed a microaggression not whether or not it actually happened but if a person and the implication here is a person of color not a non-white person if a non-white person perceives that a microaggression was made against them then by definition it did in fact occur because it doesn't yes. matter, there's no objective in this situation, it's only the subjective experience of the accuser. So therefore, it is defined in such a way so that the accused, or that the person who's being accused is guilty if they are simply accused. Yes. <laughs> Which, as you say, is something that protects us here in America from, say, angry mobs, <laughs> you know, like Antifa and or people, BAMN. Yeah, people don't realize that, uh, and that's why they want to do away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it's important to know that who is a Nazi and what is fascism? Well, it is not what we know uh, the actual definition of fascism. To them, uh, and this is coming from their websites, mm -hmm. uh, if you are pro-capitalism, you are Marx, uh, you are a fascist. If you are not pro-capitalism, but you do not oppose it, as like you're not actively fighting, right. therefore you're a collaborator, and therefore you're still a fascist. So even if you're so neutral? They, yeah, so when they say, uh, no Trump, no KKK, no fascist USA, uh -huh. all, what, what they're saying is, not the United States as it stands right now. And uh, not too long ago, uh, when the last Berkeley uh, uh, rally that uh, Joy Gibson and Tiny showed up and they got assaulted, Antifa, they, 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 because uh, you, you, now you had Nancy Pelosi, the mayor of Berkeley, the uh, mayor of San Francisco, showing them support, they were blind, you know, straight out saying, no, you know, no, uh, no wall, no KKK, no USA at all. Right. Exactly yes. what the big and because basically they they feel like they don't have to hide their intentions anymore. Yes, and that's what people don't, don't get when people say, "Oh, we are opposing fascism in the name of humanity." No, what you're saying is you want to do away with the United States, which is your ultimate goal. Yeah, and therefore anybody that's you know so that's fascism. Yes, to the the, the system. And if you are a patriot and anybody that you know that doesn't side with them, then you are a Nazi. Of course. So so anyone. And people have to get it through their heads. There is no neutral side on this thing. If you are think, oh, because I'm a leftist, guess what? You'll be thrown under the bus, just like happened mm -hmm. to that left to, to that uh, liberal uh, reporter, just because he was white and he was taking a video, even though he was supporting them, they assaulted him, and it took that violence for him to open his eyes and speak against them. I'm not sure which uh, one reporter you're talking about because you're describing quite a few reporters. <laughs> well, they, well, yeah, but uh, this uh, this was specifically happened uh, in, in Berkeley and he's uh, a reporter and uh, for for the uh, like Bay Area. Okay. And, and he's like big and actually uh, and he got he got jumped. Uh, but do you remember most of the other reporters have been like either neutral or on the right. So to them, that doesn't happen because they're just punching a Nazi. Yeah. But this guy got so offended because, you know, I'm not a Nazi. And he uh, he said, I came, the way he described it, he said, I came to Berkeley to f experience firsthand the violence and the hate of these racist Nazis. Right. And the only violence, you know, <laughs> the only violence that I saw, it didn't come from the other side. Mm -hmm. All I saw on the other side were people that were unarmed and peaceful. Yeah. And they're angry, and the violence came from my side. Yeah, and they even went after me. It took for him to for that to happen, to for him to you know, like they say, it's all fun and games until you're the target of their aggression. Sure. And they don't realize, well, guess what's going to happen if they ever get the upper hand? Yeah. Because you're going to be one of those that is going to say, hey, you know what, this is not okay. You are a Nazi, and you will be among the first ones to be shot. Right, and it's like that poem, sure. first they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak yes. up because I wasn't a trade unionist, and on and on, and then finally they came for me, and there was nobody else to speak up. 
because yes. they already come for everybody else, and I never spoke up for them. Yeah, it's amazing. And by the way, you mentioned how they're turning. They're being more and more open about again, being against liberals uh, as time goes on. So as early as February during the riots in UC Berkeley over the first appearance of Milo there, a uh, live stream from BuzzFeed, which is a leftist media organization, I think it was BuzzFeed, if not, it was something like that, uh, you could see the Antifa black block spray painting on a wall downtown, liberals get the bullet too. And I make a point to show this in my videos quite, quite often. And, and basically, okay, so on that day, you had about 100 to 200 black block people leading a charge of uh, hundreds of people, lots of people who are teachers or students at UC Berkeley, or whatever. So there's no way that people could say, oh, that was just a bunch of mass agitators that were doing the trouble. No, they all marched together and they also, lots of those people saw them spray paint, liberals get the bullet too on the wall, and they still continue to march with them. So, I mean, people have to be careful. They're becoming more open. Now, about two weeks ago in the Eugene Weekly, I'll show this in the video, um, somebody who Tabitha uh, has sleuthed out long ago as one of the ringleaders, an Islamist, and one of the ringleaders mm -hmm. of Antifa here in Eugene, he was quoted in our local paper, uh, something very disparaging against liberals. He said something like, I blame liberals for the current, whatever, fascist state of Eugene, blah, 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 blah. See, he, they're angry because they don't have the leftists on their side, not here in Eugene, at least. Uh, they do in some places, like Berkeley, but they don't have it here in Eugene, and they're very angry. So they're openly uh, anti-liberal now, these Antifa people. Carlos and I took another quick break and came back, and here we go. Eventually. Okay, go back. But it, it was just sad, because here's all these well-meaning liberals, and they're advocating for all, their own demise. They don't even see it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of that, I think, is people making the mistake of shoving everything into uh, two categories, you know, the whole binary thing and ironically a lot of these people who <laughs> like to argue that it's not valid to shove say genders into a binary model will shove everybody else into a binary model as you mentioned uh, earlier it's you're either with us or you're with the terrorists oops i mean you're either with us or you're a nazi is the new thing yeah. you know it's kind of and by the way remember jo uh, george uh, george yeah. George Harrison put in the yes, Star Wars films about how the Emperor, when he took over, oh. or before he took over, you are either with us or you're with the whatever, you know, the, the bad guys. I forget how he put it. But basically, he's, you know, it's that whole mindset. You can't just shove everything into a binary mindset. So these people that you're describing, they think, okay, I don't like Republicans. I don't like Trump. So therefore, everybody else who doesn't like Republicans, who doesn't like Trump, is my ally. And that's not true. Some of these people are honest, and some of these people are dishonest, but either way, some of these people would, as we've already alluded to and mentioned, would put those people in a firing line and shoot them if they had to, if it served their revolution. Democrat yeah. or not, progressive, liberal, whatever they call themselves, you know. Yeah. It's either you're with us or you're against us, which is a very big binary model. And unfortunately, I think right. people need to try to get out of that mindset of you're either with us or you're against, you know. It's basically what they call in sociology, in-group or out-group which is, yes. you know, it's too simplistic of a view to have, you know? And, and that's why, uh, that's why, uh, you know, I have, uh, I'm, um, the, the, the movement, you know, that we are um, supporting is, you know, and, and that's why they're so angry with us because we're calling for unity. We're calling to reach out to those people that, that like, are still able to think from both sides and say, hey, both, you know, you know both extreme are wrong, you know, and, you know, and actually, you know, both, both extremes actually have more in common than they think because the, both of them are a form of uh, uh, anarcho uh, socialist yeah. or commun anarcho communist. Right. They both uh, want to overthrow the uh, uh, the government. With the difference, is one is identitarian versus the other one is ideology. Identity. ideology. Yeah, well, identity politics is what they call it on the left, and the identi identitarianism is what they call it on the right. And notice, by the way, uh, speaking of which, I, uh, what's his name? Uh, who's the one that got punched famously? Is it Richard Spencer? The alt right guy that got punched, and you know everybody loved the fact that he got punched on TV. If I'm not yeah, saying, yeah, 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 in Portland. Spencer. I think he was. Yes, I think it was. Uh, I think it was uh, Spencer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So he is also he derides the Constitution as being something of the past. You know, it's basically the Constitution is an obstacle for both his goal and for the goal of Antifa, BAMN, Vet Flark, and everybody else. The Constitution yeah. is in their way. So. 
yes, they do have a lot more in common than they, they realize. They both play identity politics, whatever they call it. They're both against the Constitution because it gets in their way. Uh, I think they're, I mean, to me, they're both authoritarian, but they rather uh, do away with individual liberties. They're both, um, what's the word, they're more uh, collectivist than uh, libertarian, or more collectivist than individualist is perhaps a better way to put it. Uh, so yes, they definitely do have a lot more in common than they'd like to admit with each other, for sure, yes. And I think, believe, I believe that both sides want to legitimize violence, you know? Yes. Uh, and that's why, you know, like, you know, the, uh, I decided, you know, I was just sitting here at home and then one, one day I said, you know what, you can't stay silent. You know, I said, this happened in Nicaragua. Uh, you know what, I need to, you know, we need to fight for the future of our children and the children's children because, you know, I'll, I'll probably be long dead, if, you know, be, be, before this happens. But we can't just say, well, it's not going to be my problem. It's going to be their problem. No, it is our problem now. Yeah. And we, this is, we should have been fighting from the, you know, you know, from when they started, and yes. never, never actually given up. But we need to uh, educate uh, people, show them what the facts are. Uh, don't let, don't be fooled by by this. Uh, is going going down by any means necessary, which that tyrant in itself is a threat by yes. any means necessary. Sure. And you know what? Uh, if you look at the weather underground, that's exactly the same rhetoric that the chant that used to say, by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's the same people. It's Malcolm just X, they, too, as opposed to Martin, Martin Luther Martin. King. You know, I, I love and respect Martin Luther King Jr. His message was the exact opposite of Malcolm X. Malcolm X popularized the term, too, by any means necessary. By any means necessary. Uh, and really quick, this is another thing. They're, they're starting to push this rhetoric that Martin Luther King condoned riots. Okay, I've heard that on the street here in Eugene when I went to one of these rallies. I have a video about yes. somebody repeating the same thing that they're putting out there. Uh, Talib Kweli, famous rapper, saying Martin Luther King Jr. Cond uh, condoned riots. If you and edit one of his, most people would not investigate. Right, and if you edit part of his speech, you hear him say that uh, that riots are the voice of the unheard, something to that effect, and then they stop the tape. But then he says after that, but it's not okay to riot. Yep. You know, he says, it's just as necessary for me to condemn riots as it is necessary for me to condemn the conditions that give rise to riots. But they, they edit that part out. So they're trying to legitimize violence and say that there wasn't this polar thing between Malcolm X's view, by any means necessary, and Martin Luther King's view, which is uh, nonviolence, which he, by the way, got from Gandhi, uh, a gene. All about nonviolence. But yeah, they try to, they try to you know, miseducate the children and the public. They try to pervert his matches and, and, and use it to their advantage. And it's, it's sad because, uh, I mean, even uh, Martin Luther King's granddaughter has come out and spoken against these people. Yeah. You know, but uh, obviously they don't even they don't even mention it. I mean, you you know, it's kind of like, ah, whatever, you don't matter. You know? Yeah. Now, I but don't know it, if they put sad. that in the media or not, but yeah, I have heard that from independent media that she came out to say, though, look, don't disparage my, uh, don't disparage his name. He was against this violence. I think I actually saw it in, in, in one news report, and it was in, uh, it was a few quite uh, not a couple of years back. Um, but they didn't. It wasn't like like a lot of uh, newspaper out, uh, in a newspaper uh, news outlet actually run with it. It was kind of like one mention it, and it was that was the end of it. Yeah. And uh, and it was like okay, because they had their own agenda. They they want. Uh, they're not gonna go after the adults because the adults we have you know we're mature we're already. You know, less likely. We're more likely to think. We, we, you know, we've seen what's happening, and that's why they always go after the, the youth. They can manipulate them, and they're the ones that are going to be able to vote. They're the ones that are going to be able to, to, uh, to make the, you know, the changes. So, and also the future like leaders of the doing, media. Yeah, and that's and, and just like they're doing. We need to do a better job. Uh, I was telling somebody, you know, so saying, how can we, con you know, counter that? We need to encourage our kids to get into education. We need to encourage them to do that because that, that you know, if you really want to, uh, you know, fight it, you have to do what they're doing, and you got to get to their minds before they do, you know, or, or at least be the one word of reason that it might it might click in their mind and say, well, huh, why why is my teacher saying this and it's kind of contradicting to what he's saying and what he's saying it sounds a little, you know, makes a little more sense than going out there. Why why, why would I destroy my own neighborhood? And you know what? You know how am I oppressed? But you know they've been taught that they're oppressed. Yeah. And it's okay to what they've been saying for a while is 
uh, the violence and the riot is uh, is uh, not criminal because the poor and the dis disenfranchised this is the only means they have to express themselves. Right. What? Which, by the way, isn't that putting them down? Isn't that being uh, discriminatory? Isn't that stereotyping? Yeah. Isn't that, say, the soft bigotry of low expectations saying, oh, that's all they know what to do? Come on. No, when that's I not get true. Call a and they get angry because I'm not a... I'm not a Democrat. Well, that in itself is racist because you're implying that because I am Hispanic, I'm supposed to think this way. Right. And I'm not allowed to think any other way. Otherwise, you're going to call me names and disparage me. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't this coming from the same people that are against uh, bullying, but yet they have no problem bullying anybody that doesn't agree with them? Sure. As you can see, you know, they got no problem sending somebody to, uh, you know, to, you know, assault, you know, assault and bothering on me. Right in front of the police station. Yes. Because you didn't agree with them. And in front of the media, too. Yeah. Yeah, which we'll get into, by the way. That's it for this installment of this interview. Stay tuned for future installments of the same interview. It's all fascinating stuff. Hey, don't click off this video yet. I want to tell you that my best and most controversial videos are not available on YouTube, and I want to tell you how to see them. Things are changing for controversial content creators like myself. These media monopolies like Google and specifically YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, etc. do not want us. They don't want us to say what we say, to expose what we expose, and to make the waves that we do. So they take more and more measures to make us give up. They pander to the far left, the regressive left, the social justice warrior, politically correct crowd who accepts, well, demands the censorship that these companies want us all to accept or which force us to accept. To make a long story short, you should, like myself, expect my YouTube channel to disappear any day now. By all means, please subscribe to me on YouTube and click that little bell icon and do the same for my backup YouTube channel, Justin Fidel. But please subscribe to me on Speak Out, formerly called BitChute, and on Minds, where you can find my best, most controversial videos. By all means, friend me, follow me, etc. on on Facebook, but I want to encourage you to use Minds or Gab or something else instead of Facebook and Twitter, etc. Scroll down and see the links to all of my channels and social media accounts. Also, see the Facebook group Planning with Tabitha for Planning with Tabitha videos and lots of photos and videos of the lovely Tabitha. I also want to tell you that I will no longer use Twitter because Twitter requires that I delete a bunch of tweets before I can do anything else, and out of principle, to set a good example, I will not do that. To make a long story short, I got into a Twitter war with the famous rapper and rabidly racist Talib Kweli Green embarrassed the living snot out of him and well for the long story see the video below. All right folks until next time truth honor personal integrity reason responsibility peace love freedom equal opportunity and individuality. Thanks for watching.